Welcome back to this special edition Bible study series on Jesus in the Gospels. Can you believe this is lesson number eight already and we've learned so much. If this is your first time joining us, thanks so much for being here. I know you'll gain some spiritual perspective on the life of Christ from this lesson today. I'll just get you up to speed for a moment here. These last few weeks, we've been discussing, in particular, the public ministry of Jesus. Various aspects of his public ministry, such as his personal discipleship, preaching and teaching, performing miracles, and drawing out some spiritual principles, making some personal applications to our lives today. Now we're transitioning from categories of things Jesus did and said to a very specific event. Today, we're talking about the Transfiguration. And the Transfiguration was a key event in the life of Christ, a key event in the Gospels. You could say it's a mountain peak event. And yes, I'm very aware of the double meaning. It's a mountain peak event because it's a very significant event in the story of the Gospels. Also, this literally happened on a mountaintop when Jesus was transfigured. His appearance was transformed before uh, his disciples and there was a voice from God the Father in heaven and uh, Moses and Elijah appeared there before the disciples. What an unforgettable circumstance and yet what we're going to see today is that it wasn't so much the events and the circumstances in the transfiguration of Jesus, this, this mountain peak experience, it wasn't so much the events that were significant, it was the discipleship lessons that Jesus had for his disciples during that situation. The scripture says, Jesus took Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. Jesus was revealed to his disciples as what he really is, the Son of God, God incarnate, in human flesh, but now the disciples can see exactly for themselves who he really is and his power and his authority, and it changed their perspective and it changed their lives. And it may be that you can think of a mountain peak experience in your own life, and we're going to draw some parallels today. Maybe there's been a time when you have really uh, been spiritually encouraged in a, a deep and personal and meaningful way. Maybe you were attending a special preaching service, or uh, maybe a, a spiritual retreat, or a uh, camp, something of that nature, and you just felt that God was really speaking to you and doing a deep work in your heart. Well, what's that all about? And what does that experience mean? We're, we're not living our Christian life in search of special experiences, and yet sometimes God allows us to have very deep, personal, spiritual experiences with Jesus. And what does that mean to us? And how are we to respond? And what is the lesson that God wants for us to learn? Just as Jesus had a lesson for his disciples in that transfiguration event. Well, before we discuss that, why don't we pray together and we'll ask for the Lord's direction and wisdom during this lesson. Father, we thank you for the Gospels. We thank you for the message that is good news still to us today. And so many years after the time when Jesus, your Son, was living and walking and ministering here on this earth. We read these accounts and we realize the spiritual life of Christ is still at work today in our own lives and in the world around us. And as we study the transfiguration today, would you open our eyes and allow us, as, as the disciples of Jesus gained a new vision and a new perspective on the life of Christ, would you allow us to grow in that way? Also, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we're going to study this transfiguration event, this mountaintop experience, under two main points today. We're going to talk about the disciples' progress. First of all, remember the transfiguration event, it wasn't so much all about the amazing experience. It was part of a series of discipleship lessons that Jesus was taking his disciples through. And uh, we want to study what's, what's the background, what's the circumstances surrounding the transfiguration, and what exactly was Jesus leading his disciples to learn at this time. And then secondly, we'll talk about how the transfiguration event itself prepared the disciples. Point number two, the disciples' 
prepared. So point number one, the discipleship progress at this time and how the transfiguration fits into that process. And then point number two, how that event prepared the disciples. It opened up their eyes, increased their vision, prepared them for future ministry. So here we are in the timeline of the life of Christ. And I'll put up this little graphic here. And just to give you a little context, uh, here in, uh, on this timeline, it's a very simple chart. It shows just an overview of the life of Christ here on this earth. And these numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, in the little boxes, they're meant to indicate key events that happen throughout the life of Christ. And I just want to point out that the transfiguration event on this chart, the way I have it drawn out here, is point number four, where the line uh, intersects with uh, the timeline and the block says number four there. That's about halfway through the third year of the public ministry of Jesus. And we usually me me measure the public ministry of Jesus from Passover to Passover to Passover, the annual Jewish feast. And as you know, Jesus was crucified uh, at the time of the Passover. And so the transfiguration event itself, just to give you some context in the timeline, it happened right around the time of the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles uh, here in the U.S. We would think of that around, around about the month of October on our calendar. So more or less about half a year before the time of the Passover. And what's happening at this time as we read through the Gospels uh, is the conflict and the persecution that Jesus has been facing in the first two years of his public ministry is becoming far more intense all the time. So Jesus has always faced a little bit of questioning, a little bit of arguing, debate, discussion, and so forth, mostly from the religious leaders. You might remember last week we talked about the, the preaching and teaching of Jesus and how people were amazed at his doctrine. Jesus taught with real spiritual authority, not like the priests, the religious leaders of those days. And Jesus was constantly directing people's attention to a real personal relationship with God, not just the empty formalism, the empty Judaism that they were used to. And uh, you can see how that would... <clears throat> would challenge and maybe disturb the religious leaders of those days. Uh, Jesus m making these kind of remarks to people, and they might feel that he was undermining their authority. Well, anyway, that, that resistance is becoming far more intense at this time. In just a few moments, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 17, one of the places in the Gospels that talks about the Transfiguration event. And I have my Bible open already. I'm looking at Matthew 16. And in Matthew 16, the chapter right before the story of the Transfiguration, as I read down through the first part of this chapter, I can see, the first of all, the conflict, the resistance from the spiritual leaders becoming a lot more intense. Well, Jesus knew, he foresaw that that conflict was all leading toward the crucifixion. Now, the disciples did not know that, but Jesus began at this time to teach his disciples some lessons that they had never heard from him before. And you can see that right here in Matthew chapter 16, with the conflict becoming more and more intense, the religious leaders opposing Jesus. And uh, even by the time we get to the end of the Gospels, it's gone from uh, mere discussion and debate to the point where the religious leaders have literally formulated a plot to arrest Jesus and kill him. They've said that explicitly. They weren't even hiding it anymore. And Jesus knows that's what's coming in just a few months, and he begins to prepare his disciples for that. For the first time in his ministry, Jesus begins to openly teach his disciples, we're headed toward Jerusalem. And it's all downhill from here, so to speak. It's all headed toward the crucifixion. I am going to suffer abuse uh, from the religious leaders there in Jerusalem, and I'm going to be put to death. And Jesus begins to tell his disciples this for the very first time, right around the time of the, uh, the, the transfiguration that you can see on this timeline here. Also, Jesus begins to prepare his disciples in light of that, the fact of his upcoming crucifixion and death and burial and resurrection and later on his ascension back to heaven. Jesus begins to specifically prepare his disciples to carry on his ministry after he's gone. And so we find the disciples 
in a town called Caesarea Philippi. Now we'll look at this map one more time. A few weeks back we put this up for you to glance at. And once again, I'm not absolutely certain that you'll be able to see it clearly. I'll do my best to indicate way up on the north end of the map. Uh, there's a town up there called Caesarea Philippi. It's north of the Sea of Galilee. It's north of the province of Galilee. And it's a little bit south of Mount Hermon. Now Mount Hermon is that tiny dot at the very, very top of the uh, image of the map there. It's a, it's a tall mountain. It's very high altitude, and Caesarea Philippi is a town not too far from Mount Hermon. And as the, we read the story in the Gospels, that's where Jesus and the disciples were before the time of the, uh, the Transfiguration, and that's where they returned after the time of the Transfiguration to this town, Caesarea Philippi. I'll put up a photo here, and uh, just as we get into the points, you can see this photograph. I <clears throat> I've had an opportunity to visit Israel myself years back. I've actually seen this location myself. This is right in the region of Caesarea Philippi. And uh, there's, uh, there's a, uh, springs there and there's a cave. You can just see in the, the background of this picture a cave that in the old times they, um, they had dedicated as a temple to the god Pan. And there were some rel religious observances that happened right uh, there around that cave and in those days as I understand it uh, Bible scholars say that that cave was referred to as the gate of hell in those times and Jesus is just about to begin teaching his disciples a brand new kind of a lesson he's going to tell them I, I, I have to suffer I have to die eventually I'm going to leave the earth and you will receive the authority and the responsibility to carry on this ministry in my absence. And he begins to talk about the church, and he says the gates of hell will not be able to stand up against the church. And there, uh, right in that vicinity of what they called the gates of hell, in those times, Jesus was making those comments. Well, that brings us to Matthew chapter 16. And so with all that understanding, just the background about the timeline and the geographical location, here we are just ahead of the transfiguration again I'm in Matthew chapter 16 and this story is also told in Mark and Luke so Matthew 17 and Mark chapter 9 and Luke chapter 9 they all three uh, all three of those gospels tell the story of the transfiguration of Jesus but in all three cases when the story of the transfiguration is introduced in the gospels it is always preceded by this remarkable discipleship lesson so let's talk about this discipleship lesson a little bit. It gives you the right context to understand the amazing events of the Transfiguration. Those events were all part of a discipleship process. So at this time, Jesus begins to ask his disciples a question. And his disciples had the right answer to the question. You could say that they passed the quiz. And Jesus asked his disciples, Who do other people think that I am? And they gave an answer, well, some people think you're a great prophet, and some people think, you know, a good teacher, and things like this. And then Jesus asked the key question, who do you say that I am? You all, my disciples, tell me my identity. And Peter stepped forward and he said, we believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. First of all, Peter representing all the disciples, kind of as their unofficial spokesperson, he steps up, he says, we believe you are the Christ, the Messiah. The word Christ is equivalent with Messiah. We believe you are the anointed one of God. Well, that was only half the answer. That was a correct answer, but that was only part of the answer. There were many people who thought that Jesus was probably the Messiah. They hoped that Jesus was the Messiah. Peter said, we believe you are the Messiah. And that was good as far as it went. But then Peter followed up that uh, portion of the answer and he said, We believe you are the Son of the living God. Do you remember when we discussed this weeks back? Peter's declaration here means that Peter believed not only that Jesus was a very special man, but he was actually divine. We believe you are the Son of God. And that was a good answer. In fact, Jesus said, you are blessed, Peter, because flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. 
You didn't learn that from the scribes. You didn't learn that in synagogue school. In those days, the general conception that the devout Jewish person had about the Messiah was not that he was the son of God, but that he was a very special heroic man. And so Jesus said, God revealed that to you. Yes, I am the Messiah and I am the son of God. So Peter passed the quiz and the disciples passed the quiz. And it's all based on the true identity of Jesus. Who am I really? They had the right answer. And then, right after that, they failed the test. So in response to Peter's reply here, Jesus, uh, he, he's saying, Jesus, you are the Son of God, and you have all the authority and power and so forth. Jesus begins to teach the disciples, well, that's a good answer. <clears throat> and based on my authority and my identity, and based on your faith and your belief in who I am, I am going to give you the privilege of leading in the church. And for the first time in the Bible, Jesus mentions the church. The assembly. The disciples had heard that word before, but never with this meaning. Of course, in these times, we know what the church is, but for the disciples right then, that was brand new information. He, Jesus said, I am going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he went on and he said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, I will give you authority and responsibility to take the leadership in this ministry. Now I just happen to have uh, a set of keys here with me. And <clears throat> I'll just use this as an illustration as Jesus did. Jesus said to his disciples, using keys as a metaphor or a picture, he said, I am giving you the keys to the kingdom. Well, what do keys represent? If I'm going out of town and I say, here, here are my keys, while I'm away, while I'm out of town, you take my keys. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm giving you authority. Whatever the keys unlock, you get to take charge of. My car, my house, my office, whatever it may be, you have the authority to go in there to unlock the door, even to use it, because you have the keys. It also represents responsibility. If I say to you, I'm going out of town, could you take my keys? That implies I'm entrusting you with a responsibility to take care of those items that the keys relate to. Again, whether it's my house or my car or whatever it may be, here's my keys while I'm away. Can you handle that for me? And that's the exact image that Jesus is giving to the disciples when he says that. That, sound, that does not sound surprising to you and me today. We have 2,000 years of church history now to look back on and we say, well, of course, you know, the disciples, they, they took that ministry. In fact, that's the whole story of the book of Acts. That's the whole story for the rest of the New Testament. The disciples taking the responsibility of uh, carrying on the message and the ministry of Jesus in his absence. And we're not surprised because if you're a believer today, in some way, it's a result of the ministry of those early disciples. They ministered to somebody else. They led somebody else to a belief in Christ. And that person ministered to another person. And so on it goes throughout the generations. And, and, and here we are today. But at that time, this is brand new information. So the disciples are hearing this and they're thinking, wait, you're going away? I'm sorry, what? You're giving us the responsibility? It's, this is a totally new page in the in the discipleship lesson now. And you're going to Jerusalem and you're going to suffer and die. And in Matthew 16, that's exactly what Jesus began to tell them. You've got to take the keys. You've got to take the responsibility because I am leaving. And that has been the plan from the beginning. The disciples no doubt thought that it all depended upon Jesus. The ministry, the gospel message, the kingdom of heaven. It all depended upon him, and he had to be here, and he had to be present. But Jesus is beginning to teach this discipleship lesson that he will finish uh, teaching in John chapter 15. He's saying, it's better for you if I go away. It's better for you because the Holy Spirit will be present, and he will continue the life of Christ in a multiplied manner through my followers around the world. As you can probably imagine, that was a surprise to the disciples. So this is the point where we come to 
they failed the test. First of all, they passed the quiz. Jesus said, what is my true identity? They said, we know who you are and we believe you're the Son of God. And then when it came right down to application, they failed the test. Because right after the, uh, Peter had made that bold proclamation, we believe when Jesus begins teaching, I'm going away, I'm going to suffer and die, Peter rebukes Jesus. He says, no, 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 that's not going to happen to you. You're not going to suffer and be killed. Be it far from you. And Jesus has to turn around and rebuke Peter. He says, get thee behind me, Satan. You do not savor the things of God. And here at the end of Matthew chapter 16, the chapter concludes with Jesus continuing to disciple, continuing to teach these 12 men. And he says, if you want to follow me, you have to lay down your life. You have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross if you want to follow me. You have to be willing to die to everything, just like I'm going to die. And then, the transfiguration event. So that gives us the context. Once again, the point I'm trying to make here is that the transfiguration event, even though it's a mountain peak experience, even though there were so many remarkable and unusual events in connection with the transfiguration itself, it's all very much a part of a series of discipleship lessons. So in the context of that understanding, here are the new lessons that Jesus is trying to teach his disciples. Let's move ahead to the actual event itself. And here we're going to see that Jesus is preparing his disciples for what's to come. Now, why does God allow you and me to have mountaintop experiences? Again, I'm referring to those times in our lives when God allows us to learn some new, uh, deep, personal, some very meaningful spiritual lesson. And it's just so real to us and so alive. And we feel, in a sense, uh, an experience, a real personal connection with God. And God allows that from time to time. Why? And I just want to tell you, it's because he's preparing us to minister. And why did Peter, James, and John get to witness this amazing vision? Was it just so they could write it down in their journal and, and just uh, remember it and be in awe of a special occurrence? No, 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 no. Far more important than that, Jesus was preparing them for the dark days that were to come. In a sense, they were on the mountain peak when they had that amazing experience with Jesus, but now they're in the future, they're going to go down, down, down into the valley. And they're headed toward a dark day. The betrayal of Jesus, his arrest, his crucifixion. All of that is going to be very trying to them. And the story doesn't even end there. As the New Testament transitions into the book of Acts, these disciples are going to face serious challenges serious persecution. And almost every single one of these men eventually will be martyred for Christ. Because of their faith that they clearly expressed in Jesus. At the end of a very challenging ministry, all of them that we know of, except for John the Apostle, they were all put to death, just as Jesus was heading toward crucifixion. So this mountaintop experience, this event, was not just for show, not just for a, a special, special treat for the disciples. It was meant to prepare them. Now I'm turning to Matthew 17, and in just a moment I'm going to read a few verses that describe what actually happened on that mountaintop. But here I'm putting up a couple of photographs of Mount Hermon. Now, I just want to say that Mount Hermon is not considered to be the traditional site of the Transfiguration. However, I personally have some difficulty with what people consider to be the traditional site of the Transfiguration. It's far to the south. It's nowhere near Caesarea Philippi. And to me, it doesn't make any sense. So I'm saying this is not a, this is not a doctrine that's taught in the Gospels. The Gospels don't specify exactly which mountain it was. The Gospels say that Jesus went up into a high mountain that was apart, and it was also somewhere near Caesarea Philippi, and Mount Hermon fits the bill. So I'm just putting up a couple of pictures there 
of Mount Hermon. It is the highest peak in the land of Israel. It's snow covered uh, for a good portion of the year. In fact, people sometimes enjoy skiing up there on the slopes uh, during the snowy seasons. And so just to view that, you can picture how that would certainly be an isolated place, a place that other people uh, in the distance, they couldn't look up and just clearly see this private moment that Jesus was sharing uh, with Peter, James, and John. So that gives you a little bit of a visual. I have to admit myself personally, I'm one of those visual learners. I like to see a picture. It helps to cement things in my mind in a more clear way. So let's go ahead and read from Matthew 17. And again, I'm just repeating that the story is also told in Mark and in Luke, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what Bible students think of as the synoptic gospels, uh, the three gospels that share a similar perspective. And uh, here's Matthew chapter 17. If you have a Bible with you, I definitely encourage you to open your Bible and find this portion and read along. So Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, begins this way. After six days... That is a clear chronological connection with the discipleship lesson that we just talked about in Matthew chapter 16. Just a few days after that lesson, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, Elijah, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. And Peter's referring there to the Feast of Tabernacles, making some booths to sit in and to meditate and to enjoy the experience but as I keep on saying, it was not about the experience, it was about the lesson. And verse 5, while he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And there's the very presence of God. A bright cloud, just like that Old Testament Shekinah glory, and it overwhelms the entire uh, scene. And they hear a voice from heaven for the second time as recorded in the Gospels. The first time being when God the Father spoke from heaven at the time of Jesus' baptism. And now the second time, God speaks from heaven in an audible voice and he says, Listen to this man. Think about his identity. Pay attention to him. He has the power of God. He has the authority of God. Never forget that. Matthew 17, verse 6, the story continues. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Can I just take a moment to pause and reflect on that final phrase in the brief story of the transfiguration? After all the excitement, after the voice from heaven, after the visible glory of God enveloped them, after seeing actually Moses and Elijah right there, these Old Testament heroes, after all of that, they opened up their eyes and they saw Jesus only. And just the way it's phrased by Matthew, the Gospel author, helps our understanding. That's the point. That is very much the point of this transfiguration experience. That Jesus' disciples would have an unshakable confidence in who he really is. And when other things would distract their attention, and when other uh, uh, obstacles and persecutions would arise that might seek to hinder them, they wouldn't look at the distractions, they wouldn't look at the obstacles, they would continue to see Jesus only. Now let me bring the application here. Just a few points to consider. Why is it that God allows you and me 
to have these experiences in our lives. Those times that are so special, so precious to us when it seems we're just meeting with Jesus in such a remarkable way and our vision is renewed. How are we supposed to respond to an experience like that? I think at times we're like Peter. We want to hang on to the experience. Lord, let's build some booths. Let's stay right here. The tabernacles, he called them. Let's just stay in the experience. But that's not the point. God is opening our eyes for the sake of future ministry. Now, what can we expect in a mountaintop experience? I'm talking about taking the principles from this story and applying it to our own personal lives. First of all, expect to see Jesus. Expect to see Jesus. When we have clean hands and a pure heart, when we dedicate ourselves to passionately following after God and seeking Him, He will be found of us, and we will see Jesus. The experience is not about the event, the situation, maybe the special preacher that we're listening to, or the, the scenario in which we, we, we went to a, a special retreat or a camp or something like that. It's not the setting that's so special. It's not the events around us. It's not our friends that we are attending with. It's Jesus. And God opens our eyes and we see Him in a new and a fresh way. Number two, we can expect to see a transformation. I'm talking about those mountaintop experiences, those times that God allows us to really meet with Him in a special way. What are we seeing there? A transformation. Jesus was transfigured before His disciples. Did He actually change? Had He never uh, had he ever ceased to be God? Had he ever ceased to be the Son of God in all this time that he's been traveling with these disciples and ministering with them? No, he had always been God incarnate. So the fact is, Jesus himself, in his own nature, he did not change. What changed was the disciples' perception of Jesus. They saw Jesus in a new way, in a way they had never seen before. And again, that's what God allows in your life and mine from time to time. He gives us a fresh vision of Jesus and who He is, and it's all about Him. But then He opens our eyes, and Jesus has not changed, but our perception has changed. Our vision has been broadened. We see Jesus in a new way. We see a transformation. And finally, number three, expect to be transformed. As these disciples left that situation and they descended back down from that high mountain, Jesus was the same. God the Father was the same. The disciples were different. They were different men from that point forward. And yes, they were heading into dark and challenging times. And they would see Jesus uh, uh, betrayed and, and abused and crucified. But they would also see Him rise again. And they would also see the ascended Christ giving them the Great Commission. And they would also see the Holy Spirit descending upon them and enabling them for service. And in those days, those challenging days of establishing the early church that Jesus had just been teaching them about, they never forgot the transfiguration. What they had learned about Jesus stayed with them to the very end of their lives. You might be asking me, well, how do you know that? Are you just guessing? Are you just exaggerating? I know that because I can read it in the Bible. And right now I'm turning to 2 Peter chapter 1. And again, if you have a Bible, I definitely encourage you to find this book, 2 Peter chapter 1. This is that Peter, Simon Peter the man whose name Jesus changed from Simon to Peter, the man who gave that confident answer, we believe you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yes, the same Peter who turned around and denied Christ three times, the same Peter who rebuked Jesus and said, no, 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 you're not going to Jerusalem, you're not going to suffer and, and be killed. This Peter, God transformed and made a dynamic, unshakable rock in the founding of the early church. And as Peter writes this book, 2 Peter, he says, The Lord has allowed him to see 
that very soon he's going to die. And tradition tells us that Peter himself would be crucified. When he died, he died a martyr's death, and he was crucified just like Jesus had been. And he writes in chapter 1 of this, this second, this last epistle in the New Testament, Peter says, verse 13, As long as I am in this tabernacle, this body, I want to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Verse 14, Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. So he's saying, I know I'm going to leave this body very soon. Verse 15, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. So verse 16, Peter is writing to his Christian friends and disciples saying, Before I die, I want to exhort you one more time. Do not ever forget these truths that I've given to you. And here's why. 2 Peter verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 16, Peter says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. It's not fiction. It's not a story. It's not exaggeration. I'm about to go to a martyr's death. Not for an exaggeration. Not for a legend. It's not a cunningly devised fable. The Gospel of Christ when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now let me ask you that. Where and when did that occur? when Peter and other disciples actually saw the majesty and glory of God revealed in Jesus Christ, when they, saw God, uh, they heard God Himself speak in commendation of His Son Jesus, where and when did that occur? Verse 17, verse 18, And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with Him in the holy mount. To the very end of his life, Peter never forgot that mountaintop experience. And to the very end of his life, that memory of seeing Jesus as he really is gave him boldness and courage and passion and determination to reach others and to disciple them as Jesus had discipled him. And I just want you to reflect today as we wrap up. Has there been a time in your life when God has allowed you a mountaintop experience? A special spiritual lesson that you've learned, something that's been so deep and real and meaningful to you. And let me just say, it's not for you only. It's for somebody else. And God is preparing you not just to sit and enjoy His special presence, but to pass that on to somebody else. Will you do that this week? I hope you will. Well, that's our lesson for today. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And until next week, God bless you.